Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California. It's Just the Tip Stirs with Melissa Morgan. If you've got a tip on anything weird, wild, or wonky, an unsolved murder, a real-life mystery, a recipe that actually makes kale taste like real food, anything, tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's area code 832-847-7837. Or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. You just might hear your tip on the podcast. And now here's your host, insisting just a little too strongly that she's no relation to Dexter, Melissa Morgan. More cowbell. As far as I know, I am not related to Dexter Morgan. Uh, He was adopted, and I was not, as far as I know. I'm also not related to Cincinnati Reds great Joe Morgan. Well, now that is a lie. (laughs) You you've got a great swing at the at the plate, baby. Uh, Okay, I'm also not related to J.P. Morgan. The woman who used to play on match game a lot. I'm not oh, I lie. thought you were talking about the financier. Oh yeah, or... him either. No. None of the I I'm I don't think any of the Morgan I'm not related. I'm not related to the Morgan horse from Wales. That's actually where our name came from, but um I'm not related to anyone. I I'm uh what Ron Bennington refers to as an endling. I have ended the Morgan name, although I still keep it my maiden name. I really, I actually like it. I, I love my married name too, producer Mark Humphreys. But as as you can attest, uh, no one else knows how to say it. That is a problem. <laughs> that is a problem. I love that you are comfortable enough in your own skin to allow me to put our name down at a restaurant as Morgan because we have waited outside way too many times while... The youth of today have yelled out, Humper He's, party of two, Humper He's, or Humper Dink, party of two. Um, so yes, it's a beautiful thing when someone, nobody fucks up Morgan. So when someone says, Morgan, party of two, Mr. Morgan, come right this way, and you just kind of go, <laughs> and giggle. It's so, it's very sweet. I Be- like being Mr. Morgan. It's very sweet, because a lot of people would probably not like that, but... You are a special fella, and I'm sorry that your uh, father's last name is Humperhees, according to the youth of today. Which brings me to a guy who may have been comfortable in his own skin and was definitely comfortable in other people's skin, mostly women. That is my beloved Bob Crane. Now, some of you are going to be too young to remember him uh, because I'm old And I had a huge crush on Bob Crane as a youngster. Fairly. What? What? You never told me that. I did. I had a couple of crushes. Um, Ilya Kuryakin from Man From Uncle. Uh, As a very young child, I used to attempt to crawl through the television to kiss him. Well, you weren't alone there. Lots of women across America liked him. He was he was very cute, very cute. And um, David McCallum is the actor's name. Uh, uh, he an older now British man, but still just as handsome. He actually um, played a like a, a corner on uh, might still play a corner named Ducky on uh, NCIS. But he was the most handsome double agent spy from the man from uncle that this three-year-old from Kentucky ever saw. And I was like, me likey this man, me try to crawl through television to kiss him. I'm not sure why I spoke like I was from another country, but um, I also had a huge crush on, on um, Bob Crane. Now I believe what I saw were reruns. I, I don't think I saw the original show, Well, the original show was on when, like, you were two. Yeah, like 65 to 71. So I would have been, like, uh, six or five or six or something. So I I do remember seeing it as as an older child because I could could understand a little bit more about what was happening. So I'm guessing I saw reruns, probably local, locally run reruns um, pretty much every night. I remember around dinner time thinking that um, Bob Crane was a handsome fella. And he was. And one of the things I really liked about him was his voice. I've been a a voice lover um, 
since I was a little kid and my mother worked in radio, she had a beautiful voice of her own, but she was behind the scenes. She was the traffic director uh, for a huge 50,000 watt radio station in Cincinnati. And at the time, a traffic director did not mean she looked at how cars were moving. She was responsible for when all of the commercials aired, uh, the times that they showed up. And as she got to where she um, knew within seconds if a commercial wasn't playing at the right time. And she loved her career in, um, in radio. And then she got pregnant with me and said I ruined her life. So, so I got that going for me. I have a feeling she didn't say that, actually. Well, all right. She probably didn't say it. I just took that on myself because you know me. I'm, I'm me. So Bob Crane's beautiful voice was, was really kind of captivating to me. And I was fascinated when I... Um, total hat tip to Jennifer Perry and Scott Jenkins, uh, friends of ours who, um, kind of brought up something and I was like, uh, they both were like, don't, sh- don't tell anyone. And they were just kidding. And I was like, I am Sergeant Schultz. I, I see nothing. I know nothing. The, the great John Banner who played Sergeant Schultz on Hogan's Heroes, who never saw anything <laughs> because he didn't want to get involved or get in trouble. And, uh, I was like, I, I accused Jennifer and Scott of, being too young to know Hogan's heroes. And they were both like, girl, you shut the fuck up. Actually, neither of them talk like that, but they both said that they knew Hogan's heroes. In fact, Scott sent me a hilarious meme of John Banner as Sergeant Schultz saying, I see nothing in a bad German accent. So before Bob Crane was known as uh, Robert Hogan in Hogan's heroes, he was kind of an interesting child prodigy uh, born in 1928 and raised in Connecticut. And he was a drummer, loved the drums from a very early age and actually kind of put together some bands, um, and drumming and marching like at the age of 11. And it's a little known fact that the, the sort of very distinctive drumming that is at the beginning of Hogan's heroes before they would come back from commercials, that was him. He actually played the drums that was recorded that were re- that was recorded for the show. So, little Bob Crane, cute little Bob Crane, born in 1928, July of 1928, uh, starts his lovely career in drumming and then in radio. At first um, in New York and then in Bristol, Connecticut, and then Bridgeport, Connecticut, and then he gets shipped out to the west coast to the flagship flagship station of knx in los angeles and he was brought out to re-energize the station's ratings and kind of cut down um his erosion of suburban ratings at wcbs in new york so they brought him out thinking he would just fill in and he blossomed he actually um became the number one radio show in Los Angeles morning. He was known as the king of the LA airwaves. He had guests like Marilyn Monroe and Frank Sinatra. He would drum on his morning radio show. And he was obviously very funny. He then got to guest host for Johnny Carson on his daytime game show, Who Do You Trust? Uh, He did, you know, some guest starring things like The Twilight Zone and Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And he had Carl Carl Reiner on his radio show, and he persuaded him to put him in The Dick Van Dyke Show. So he's, you know, beginning to be a working actor. And then in 1965, he's offered the starring role in a television situation comedy about a German POW camp, Hogan's Heroes. So this is where... Um, and this is a short, a short clip, but if you can find a longer clip, which we could not, it's pretty priceless. Gilbert Gottfried, who, you know, is obviously <laughs> an interesting fella, has a hilarious bit. And if you know anything about the entertainment industry, it's difficult to get a meeting, a pitch meeting with an executive of anything, whether it's a television show, a, a movie idea, um, your own podcast. I had to meet with myself and tell myself no, but then I ended up, you know, saying yes. So anyway, this is a, a, a pretty freaking funny idea that Gilbert Gottfried had. Can you hit it, producer Mark? Who was the guy who was able to sell the idea for Hogan's Heroes? Who 
was able to walk into a network one day and go, here's the idea, a group of American soldiers in a Nazi prison camp. It's a comedy. <laughs> Gee, I like it. Tell me more. Well, they're held prisoner by Nazis, and if they try to escape, they'll be shot. I love it. <laughs> it's a feel-good comedy. That's that's a clip from from the Conan O'Brien show where um, if you can see Gilbert doing the actual bit, which is elongated, doing stand-up, that is a great thing to see. This is just he's sitting on the panel kind of discussing. And it is a hilarious, like, how does how did that get greenlit? Was it, obviously it was before there was any uh, known, well-known uh, people of the Jewish faith in the entertainment industry, I'm guessing, because I don't know that they would, you know, put that on the air now. I don't know. It reminds me of that really horrible WB show that came out in the, I can't remember if it was the 80s or not, it must have been the 90s, called uh, Homeboys in Space. Oh, I don't remember that one. Oh, because it didn't last long. But I, I worked at, at the time for a manager who managed actors, and um, it was called Homeboys in Space. And th- this manager gave the script to several of her clients of uh, African-American descent. And I remember one person like, do you see here they're calling the car a hoopty? It's not a car, sorry, spaceship. They're space hoopty. And they were so insulted they wouldn't even audition for. These are starving actors who would, you know, pretty much do anything. Were so insulted by homeboys from space, and I don't blame them. So I'm guessing Hogan's Heroes was the homeboys from space of 1965. But it became a really big hit. And, you know, there are there's theories that, you know, it's like, um, well, it made the Germans look stupid. Yeah. Okay. Still kind of an odd idea. I mean, it's, you know, and they had the underground railroad, basically, you know, you like hit hit the bunk that you're sleeping in three times. And, you know, you could go down the steps and end up in France or something. It was very, I just remember thinking Bob Crane was cute. That's my whole thing. So the show is like last for six years. He had been married to his high school sweetheart and he divorced her in 1970, just prior to their 21st anniversary. And he married, everyone knew, because you could see the chemistry on screen, the the beautiful blonde who played um, Colonel Clink's secretary, Hilda. And her real name is Patricia Olson. Why Patricia Olson picks a stage name of Sigrid Valdez, I'm not ever going to know. I'd, uh, Patricia Olson, great name. Sigrid Valdez, I guess trying to sound, uh, you know, it, it would usually be the other way around. Your name is Sigrid Valdez, and you're like, nobody's going to fucking book me. I'm Patricia Olson. No, she's Sigrid Valdez. So that's pretty interesting. So they get married actually on the set of Hogan's Heroes um, in 1970. And then they have their first child, Scotty, who's born in 1971. So they end up sort of separating after the show ends, and and he tries some interesting stuff. But apparently... According to uh, several family members, they had sort of reconciled before he'd passed away. So things don't go as beautifully for Bob Crane as we would like. Handsome, funny, beautiful voice. And he actually maintained his show on KNX for quite a while until uh, I guess they realized that Hogan's Heroes was going to be successful. So he really kept his hand in radio for a while. But after the show is canceled, he... um, does a couple of things. He does a Disney film, um, Super Dad, actually two Disney films, Super Dad in 1973 and Gus, which was about a donkey from what I remember, in 1976. So he <laughs> he's, you know, divorces his beautiful uh, Patricia Olson slash Sigrid Valdez, uh, Hilda, and you know, he's kind of a man on the town. He ends up doing a, a TV show that does not last long. It's the Bob Crane show, 13 episodes. And the um, the zeitgeist of the TV show sounds really, really gripping. He it's a, it's a situation comedy where he plays an insurance guy in his 40s who quits his job to go back to med school. Na, 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 na. I'm guessing he goes back to school to be a gynecologist, but I don't, I, I could be wrong. 
I could be very wrong. No, you never know. I mean, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Insurance agent who goes back to school in his 40s to be a doctor. Oh, my God. I guess maybe they couldn't come up with like, he plays Anne Frank's father or something in a really funny, hilarious, right. go back to what you know, Nazi. Okay. So he, I love this tidbit that he is introduced to John Henry Carpenter by Richard Dawson of Hogan's Heroes um, fame. He's plays the British guy. And he went on to host, you know, Family Feud. And he was kind of known as a rounder. Um, I remember him hosting The Tonight Show, filling in for Johnny Carson. And there was a beautiful blonde actress named Susan Smith who had been, no, Susan Sullivan, pardon me, who was kind of a B actress in some like nighttime uh, dramatic uh, soap opera type things. That's what she was sort of known. And she was visibly uncomfortable as a guest on the show as Richard Dawson is hosting. And finally she admits that they had known each other years before. And he, and she's trying to delicately explain that Richard Dawson spent way too much trying time trying to get her in bed. And she finally says to him to get him to back off. Look, my father said that, um, a relationship is like cake and the in sex is just the icing. So whatever show she was working on, Richard Dawson sent her an uniced cake, an unfrosted cake. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause he's as my mama used to say, he put the B in subtle. Yeah. He a real was debonair. He was subtle. So um so yeah, I love that that piece of information that Richard Dawson actually introduced Bob Crane to the man who would eventually be um, indicted for his murder, but then found not guilty. So Richard Carpenter, kind of a weirdo, uh, hanger on, a regional sales manager for Sony Electronics. <laughs> and he uh, helped famous people get their video equipment on, so to speak. And so they, you know, became friends because I think Bob Crane had a a large narcissistic streak. And he was very handsome, very talented, obviously intelligent. And I think he just liked looking at himself. I don't know if it was, you know, according to his son, Scotty, like um, Polaroids and num numerous videotapes was very always into cameras. And I think a lot of it, he liked to take pictures of himself and obviously videos of himself as they found after his death. So, you know, he and uh, Robert Crane and um, John, Carpenter would go out to bars and quite often. And of course, Bob Crane would get the chicks because he's, you know, still a celebrity hanging on to his, you know, the the Gus movie from Disney. And John Carpenter would get the, you know, leftovers, let's say. So he would introduce him as his manager. He would say, oh, this is my manager, you know, so, you know, throw my manager a, a lay or something, whatever. So he set up, John Carpenter helped him set up a, a large amount of videotaping. In fact, Robert Crane at this point is now living in Scottsdale, Arizona, because he had bought the rights to a comedy, a play called Beginner's Luck. And he was touring in it. He was starring and directing. And he was, you know, um, he started it at a, uh, get this, the Showboat Theater. <laughs> um in Florida. And then he, you know, was at the La Mirada Civic Center and finally ends up at the Windmill Dinner Theater in Scottsdale. Oh my God, I'm so sad now. And um, so John Carpenter and he apparently taped many, many of their sessions with the women, with the ladies. And, and I think Bob really enjoyed looking at himself. I'm, you know, a guy that has that much of a issue with taking his own picture and videotaping himself. I'm going to guess he had like a giant cock. I could be wrong. I've never seen the videotapes. Perhaps he's just like, you know, average Joe, Joe Schmo. But I'm just going to guess he had like a, I, like you could hear it thud when he took off his pants or something as it hit the floor. I don't know. I can't imagine why anyone, maybe it's just because I have such issues with my own body, but I can't imagine anyone wanting to videotape themselves like every goddamn time you have sex. Uh, apparently sometimes alone, like autoerotic things, but I don't know for sure. So I know producer Mark and I saw the film Autofocus um, that starred Greg Kinnear as Bob Crane and Willem Dafoe 
interestingly enough, as John Carpenter. And it, it was, Paul Schrader directed it, and according to Robert Crane Jr., his son with his first wife, you know, there was a lot in there that wasn't true. And apparently Bob Crane wasn't really into the BDSM world. He wasn't really into bondage and sadomasochism. That was Paul Schrader adding that in after an experience of his own. And I was like, you know, that's not such a great thing to do as a director. Like this is a biopic about a guy who's been murdered and I'm going to say he's into BDSM. No, yeah, he really wasn't. But he was into like pretty much everything else, apparently. And definitely the ladies. But they did make it seem in the film that Willem Dafoe's character of character, it's real life, John Carpenter, was kind of enamored with Robert Crane. Like maybe liked him more than a friend, if you get my drift. Winky wink. You can't see on a podcast, but I'm winking like I have um, palsy right now. I'm winking my eye to death. So I think perhaps John Carpenter had a little well, crushy, crushy, crush, crush, a little man crush, maybe a little more than a man crush. Apparently he was bisexual. So um, they are kind of, I wouldn't say falling on hard times, but things are not, you know, going great um, <laughs> for poor Bob, who's in, in his amazing play Beginner's Luck in the Windmill Dinner Theater in Scottsdale. Living the high life. Living the high life. And then having dinner at four in Scottsdale, going to bed at nine after you videotaped yourself with different ladies. I'm just going to say it like that. So Bob Crane, uh, in June of 1978, two weeks from his 50th birthday, two bloody weeks from his 50th birthday. I just kept thinking what a fun party he would have with like women with feathers sticking out of their butts or, I mean, I bet it was going to be like a blowout. So, um, on the so after to speak, so to speak, yes, so to speak. So on the afternoon of June 29th, 1978, his co-star from, um, beginner's luck, Victoria Ann Barry entered his apartment when he failed to show up for a lunch meeting and discovered his body. Now, Bob Crane had been bludgeoned to death with a weapon that's never found. It's been, um, posited that it was a camera tripod. I feel like that is sort of a fascinating piece of information considering his love of video taking, taping himself. And there was an electrical cord around his neck. Now, apparently the pictures are quite gruesome and they're, his son describes them as like a, um, a fan of blood uh, above the headboard. And I mean, he, it, it, I don't think it went, it went well. I think he was, it wasn't like, I'm going to hit him once and leave. I think it was pretty bad shit. So his funeral, this is also another thing I think is pretty fascinating. His funeral uh, was in July of 1978, a couple days later at um, a Catholic church in Westwood. And he had, you know, a whole lot of stars attend like Patty Duke and Carol O'Connor. Um, I love that uh, two of his uh, pallbearers were co-stars from Hogan's Heroes, Larry Hovis and Robert Clary, who insists on being called Robert Clary because he's apparently just a cock. So um, he was interred at a, a memorial park in Chatsworth, but um, Sigrid Valdez, a.k.a. Patricia Olson later had his remains relocated to the Westwood Village Memorial Park so that she's buried next to him after she died from lung cancer in 2007. And their headstones have a picture of him dressed as, <laughs> as Robert Hogan and her dressed as Hilda. And it says Hogan and Hilda together forever. Oh, now, that's so romantic. It's, it's a little... It's a little sad. I think it's a little sad. But you know what? It just, I guess she really loved him. And all those years later, you know, I don't know. I just, it's just a little sad. At least she didn't have a picture of him on his headstone from the movie Gus. Well, that's true. Or, or, or from the play Beginner's Luck. Or from one of his videos. <laughs> yes. No. Um, so this is, you know, 1978. And the investigation at the Scottsdale Police Department is, 
let's just call it slightly botched. It's a, you know, it's a small police department. Most people in Scottsdale probably just die from old. And they didn't have a homicide division. So they didn't really know how to handle a a murder, let alone a high profile murder. So the crime scene really didn't yield a lot of clues. There was no forced entry. There was nothing of financial value taken. Um, They, you know, detectives examined his extensive videotape collection. (laughs) I'm sure like, you know, in their off hours too, but it helped them find John Henry Carpenter. Now he had flown to Phoenix the day before Bob Crane's murder. He was going to spend a couple of days with him. So they end up searching his rental car. And this is, again, 78. So there's not, you know, there's no DNA yet. So there's several blood smears um, that are found in the passenger seat and I believe in the trunk. And they match Bob Crane's blood type, but it's that's really not enough. So there's really nothing else that material that they can find. So the Maricopa County attorney declines to file charges. So 12 years later, a detective, a Scottsdale detective, Jim Raines, uh, who had come, you know, from the big town of Phoenix, where there's just a murder a minute. um, He reexamined the evidence from the 78 case and persuaded the county attorney to reopen the case. So there's DNA testing now in um, 90 it's still inconclusive. Um, this detective found some uh, f- uh, in the evidence file a photograph of the car's interior, and I remember this actually because the the case was covered so heavily by the news. Apparently, there was a piece of brain tissue in a picture. You know, I don't. You can't. It could. You know, what if it's like a, a piece of play-doh or silly putty or something. Yeah, how do they know it's brain tissue? Uh, right. So the actual tissue samples that were taken from the car were lost somewhere in the files. So they have, you know, some of his blood, quite frankly, or some, sorry, some blood and, um, and a picture of what could be brain tissue or silly putty. And an Arizona judge actually decided, you know what? This new evidence is admissible. We're going to charge John Henry Carpenter. So in June of 1992, he's arrested in Southern California and brought back to Arizona, and he's charged with Bob Crane's murder. So the trial is pretty fascinating. I, they they bring up quite a bit that John Carpenter probably was secretly in love with Bob Crane, and uh, his son... Bob Crane's son, Robert Jr., actually testified and said that my dad was going to cut John Carpenter out of his life. He had called him a hanger on. He didn't really want to be around him anymore. And he was going to call him the night before he was murdered and say, I just, we have to end our friendship. Now, Robert Crane Jr. says it's be, he also added because this man was in love with my father. We really don't have any proof of that. And of course, John Carpenter, you know, professed his innocence the entire, you know, way through. So Carpenter's attorneys, I guess, probably did um, a yeoman's job. They probably did like the OJ Dream Team. They attacked the prosecutor's case and it's totally circumstantial and inconclusive. And it really is. It really is. So they, you know, they don't have to work that hard, but... They um, presented some evidence that a waitress from a local restaurant um, had seen them talking the night before and they were still friends. Um, You know, they said the murder weapon has never been identified, let alone found. True. Um, The prosecution's theory that it was a tripod, complete speculation. Yeah, true. And they based it on, you know, the fact that this is Carpenter's job. He's a salesman for, you know, big video company. So they said that a lot of the work was the police photos were done badly. There's that you can't tell that that's brain tissue in a picture. Uh, the police work was sloppy, mishandled. 
um, evidence, you know, misplaced and lost. Totally true. Totally true. So they then bring up all of the photos and videotapes saying it could have been any number of people because he was, you know, a little bit of a whore bag. It could have been all of these women. Maybe one of them was a spurned lover. It could be um, the boyfriends or husbands of all of these women that he had seduced and slept with because he didn't apparently, he wasn't like picky. I don't think you had to be single. I think you just had to have like a vertical slit somewhere in your body that he could, you know, take advantage of. And apparently several months before he was murdered in uh, Texas, I think when he was on tour with the awesome Beginner's Luck play, um, a a husband of a wife he had seduced said, you know, I'm going to kill him. I, I will... I swear my vengeance on you. So with all of that in mind, it it gets John Carpenter acquitted. So he, you know, he gets to come back to Southern California. He then becomes, you know, um, a big regional manager for Akai Films, like A-K-A-I. I don't, I don't know them. Big, big camera maker. Okay. Video. Yeah. Thank you, producer Mark. Yeah, I, I didn't know. So um, John Carpenter points the finger at, Patricia Olson slash Sigrid Valdez and said, nobody got a dime out of this murder except for one person saying that he left, you know, everything to his, his widow. They were still married and uh, it excluded him, his siblings, his mother. It's like, huh, really? So the Maricopa County district attorney, Rick Romley, who actually prosecuted the case said, we've never considered Patty a suspect. I am convinced that John Carpenter murdered Bob Crane and his murder is just officially going to be unsolved. So in November of 2016, the Maricopa County Attorney's Office permitted a Phoenix television anchor, John Hook, who was familiar with the case but had never really looked into the details. To have they they permitted John Hook to have this 1978 blood samples from John Carpenter's rental car for retesting. They gave them to John Hook, a, a news anchor in Scottsdale, because he's writing a book now. He was writing a book. It's it's finished actually. This case has spawned not only the movie Autofocus, but Um, Robert Crane Jr. wanted to do a film called F-Stop, The Murder of Bob Crane. There were two or three movies in the works. I wonder who greenlit those. And then Autofocus came up and everyone pulled their projects away. So Robert Crane Jr.'s book came out in February of 2015, and it's called Crane, colon, Sex, Celebrity, and My Father's Unsolved Murder. Nice. And John Hook is interviewing Robert Crane Jr. because it's the city there that he works in as a news anchor reporter. And it's a pretty interesting case all these years later. It's going to be the 40th anniversary, actually, this year. And he decides to write his own book. So John Hook's book came out in February of 2017. And it is called Who Killed Bob Crane? So I... I really love when people spend a lot of time on their titles of their books. Who killed Bob Crane? Thanks, John Hook. So he took the 1978 blood samples and had them retested because DNA is now advanced. And there were two male profiles identified. One is an unknown male and the other is too degraded to reach a conclusion. So the blood type that was found that was Bob Crane's blood type was his blood type. That blood was retested and it's not his DNA. So I don't know if John Carpenter just like hauled around a bunch of men who were bleeding a lot or exactly what happened, but pretty interesting shit that there's blood in his rental car. Who knows? Maybe it was from the guy who rented it before then. Could have been Mark Humphreys. Oh no, you weren't on the road then. Never mind. Sorry. I'm always trying to throw you under the bus. I don't. I, I, but <laughs> I know. I'm I sorry. Like I just me. have so many questions. I, you know, ever since um, Michelle McNamara's book came out, I'll be gone in the dark about the Golden State Killer. 
and the wonderful uh, cold case detective Paul Holes from Contra Costa County has, uh, you know, put his theory out that it's someone who's in the real estate slash development world. I have been giving my husband the side eye. We've been watching the documentary on uh, ID. Uh, whatever it's called, that network is called. And, and every time that they mention that this detective Holes, who she, who she, Melissa seems to be in love with, every time he mentions the real estate industry, she looks at me and points a finger at me. And I she, do. I do a lot of finger pointing. I know you're not the Golden State Killer, but. I don't, I work for a real estate <laughs> firm. I am, I don't do that stuff. I'm in a different part of the industry. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what a lot of guilty people say. I know you didn't kill Bob Crane. I know you were way too young. I I get it. You did rent a lot of cars when you were on the road for like 10 years as a singer-songwriter, but I know you didn't kill Bob Crane. Sometimes I just, you know, I I wonder. But anyway, I know I know it's not you. I know it's not you. Why, thank you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Scotty Crane wanted to make a film called F-Stop and uh, Patricia Olson wanted to <laughs> make a film called Take Off Your Clothes and Smile. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what your widow we does. You can see why she was not in development. <laughs> Anyone who changes her real name from Patricia Olson to Sigrid Valdez should not be allowed to do anything. She was really pretty blonde and she should have just stayed there and smiled. Um one of Scotty Crane's quotes, which I think is is lovely. Now he's he's the only son that Bob Crane and and Patricia Olson had. Uh, you know he he said that several of the things in autofocus were not realistic about his father, including the fact that Paul Schrader made it seem like he was this you know um, family man who went to church all the time. And he, and Scotty Crane said during the last 12 years of my father's life, he went to church three times when I was baptized, when his own father died and when he was buried. And I'm pretty sure that's probably true. I'm guessing. So John Hook's book actually has, um, some of the creepier details. Um, he has some pictures, more of the sorted, sorted details, you know, kind of, kind of creepy shit. So he has kind of two different families, Bob Crane, you know, the, the first family with, with the first wife and then the second family with, with Patricia Olson slash Sigrid Valdez, Scotty. So I feel like the best quote from a family member comes from Robert Crane Jr., in his book, Crane, colon, Sex Celebrity and My Father's Unsolved Murder, which, by the way, published by the University Press of Kentucky, I've never been more proud to be from Kentucky than knowing that they published a book with the title, Crane, colon, not the organ, the punctuation, Sex Celebrity and My Father's Unsolved Murder. That is spectacular. So Robert Crane Jr.'s <laughs> quote that just makes everything, it solidifies everything for me. He said, the red light was always on in my dad's makeshift film processing lab. And that's the way I like to think of Robert Crane. Robert Crane, your red light is still on. And more cowbell. And remember, if you've got a tip for us, give us a call at 832-TIPSTER. That's area code 832-847-7837. Or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. <laughs>